my interview with legendary NLP master Steve Andreas continues. Stay tuned. This is Damon Cart from NLP Gym. Before we continue my interview with Steve Andreas, if you have not subscribed to this channel, please do that now. And also, I'll include a link right down here in the comments and in the description so that you can sign up for a free webinar. This is the webinar that I'm putting on this coming Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, where I will be explaining how the self-concept works. There will be plenty of takeaways that you can use right away to, for your own self-improvement. And also, if you're a coach, if you're a life coach, you'll be able to implement these techniques into your practice immediately. And you also grew up in, in different parts of the country? Right. Hawaii was where you were born? Right. Okay. And then from there, where did you go? Oh, I don't know. I can't remember it all. Oops, too many. When the First World, Second World War started, we evacuated from Hawaii and went to Vermont, where my mother had some friends running a summer camp for kids. I spent the summer camp there, and we just went all over the country, mostly east and west coasts. Was your father military? No. You went to um, college, was it undergrad for, was it chemistry? Chemistry, right. Chemistry. Caltech. And then you went to the graduate, you went to get your graduate degree, what was that in? Well, I went to Brandeis because of Abe Maslow and his book Motivation and Personality. It was a really breath of fresh air. There were, essentially, there were two camps in psychology at that time. One was Freud and one was Skinner. The only thing they agreed on is if you loved somebody, it was because they looked like your mother. <laughs> and uh, that was kind of a, a wasteland. Mm -hmm. and, and Maslow's book at least talked a good story about creativity and being uh, more than just synapses. And so, you know, his, his book was a real eye-opener. It came out in 1957, which was the year I graduated from college. And I worked for a year as a chemist and then applied to Brandeis. And the one thing I'll be forever grateful for is, is Abe Maslow wanted to bring some new blood into the field. So he insisted that none of the uh, applicants, none of the successful applicants for graduate school at Brandeis could have an undergraduate degree in psychology. So the, I was a chemist, there was a chemical engineer, there was a mathematician, there was a religious guy with a degree in religion and another woman with social work and so on. I think there were about eight or ten of us. None of us had a background in psychology because he wanted to bring in some new thinking and new, new uh, approaches to things. I don't think it really worked, but it, made, it meant that I could uh, go to grad school. After two years I dropped out and got a master's degree. And that wasn't very impressive, but it opened a few doors. Did you study just all after that, I'm assuming, with Fritz Perls? Yeah, that was 67. Okay. What was, what was that like and what was he like? I heard a lot of different stories. Well, he was, he's his own man. I went to an evening thing that he did in San Francisco in a high school, and the high school had signs all over, no smoking, no smoking, no smoking, and he smoked through the whole demonstration. <laughs> which was, a, the, the demonstration was impressive. I was hanging around listening to him talk to some other people. I was too scared to ask him any questions, and my questions would have been pretty dumb at that point anyway. But I was listening in, and a woman came up to him and says, Dr. Pearls, well, there are all these signs that say no smoking. How do you have the right to do it? And he took his cigarette out of his mouth, and he says, I don't have the right, and I do not have the right. I just do it. I really liked that. And so he went, that was when he won you over and he started studying with him? Well, that was part of it. Actually, I introduced my mother to Gestalt. After that, my mother was in the Bay Area at the time. And, I, and he was going to do a workshop, which I couldn't attend because it was during weekdays when I was teaching. I said, take this workshop, you won't be sorry if, you're, if, you, don't, if you don't like it, I'll pay for it. So she actually got in before I did in terms of any in-depth training. And I assume she 
liked it because she stuck with it, didn't she? She did, yeah, yeah. and I did too. And the next summer there was a month long at Esalen with Fritz and I signed up for that. Summer of 68. So did you pretty much do just all up until you were introduced to NLP or did you yeah. stop? Okay. Introduced to NLP in 77, I think. And what was that like? Well, it was, uh, I was very skeptical. But uh, there, was enough th there was enough testing that went on that I could verify or not the things that were, were being said. And I went to a, a uh, Association of Humanistic Psychology meeting in San Francisco. A friend of ours had just come back from a five-day Bandler Grinder workshop. Looking back on it, his impromptu presentation wasn't very detailed or accurate or, or very appropriate, very good. But there were the IXS and Qs, and Connie Ray and I went. We both went to this and. We went home and started asking people, you know, how many doors in the, in your house? And we count their eye blinks, predict ahead of time how many doors they had in their house. And that convinced me <laughs> that it was testable mm -hmm. and anchoring and various things like that. that they're all things that could be tested. Well, I had several workshops in Michelle therapy planned and I gave them all up and canceled them all and said I'm a I feel like a kid with a bag of new marbles and a bandaged thumb. Set ourselves the task of learning everything we could. You know, I heard that uh, you guys, when Bandler was going through his legal problems, that you guys lent him the money uh, for his legal fees, and, and then he turned around and sued you years later. And uh, she said, no, we didn't lend it to him. And I was like, oh, okay, well, that, maybe I just didn't hear that story correctly. And she said, he never paid us back, so we, <laughs> we actually gave it to him. Oh, no, that's not true. <laughs> oh, that's you're, not you're true. You're remembering badly. No, the situation was we'd published uh, three of their books, Frogs into Princes, hmm. Reframing and Transformations. And we had a contract in which we owed them a certain amount of money guaranteed per year. It was an outrageous royalty. It was a 20% total royalty on the books, which is unheard of in the publishing. And if you're, if you're God and you're publishing the Bible, you don't get 20%. Mm. But we thought we could do it, and we did. So we owed him a bunch of money uh, by contract ahead of time. And so basically we lo loaned him advances on that. Mm. So we did get paid back. So I don't know where that got twisted around, but mm. okay. we, we didn't lose money then. Later on, when he was trying to um, regain control over the, the words NLP and, and, and neuro-linguistic programming, he was doing everything he could to put the genie back in the bottle. Mm. It's kind of funny because over the years we kept writing him, I still have the letters he wrote saying, you've got to control this, you've got to have some kind of uh, trademark or copyright, well not copyright, trademark on the processes and so on like that. If you don't, it's, it's going to be out of the bottle and you won't be able to put it back in. They ignored all that for years and then, then Vandler wanted to reassert his rights and the only way he could do that is sue everybody who was doing NLP at the time and, and certifying and so on. So. It wasn't really personal. It was a pain in the ass. It took a, took about six months out of my life and a lot of energy and a lot of money. And luckily, we had advertising injury insurance that paid the legal fees, but that was over a hundred thousand dollars. Wow. Which is peanuts in terms of legal fees. Anyway, we settled out of court as by the advice of our lawyer, and I'm glad we did. I hated to do it because we hadn't done anything wrong, but. It was a smart thing to do. Did something personal happen? And if you don't want to talk about it, I understand. But because uh, when I did meet Van Lern, um he was signing. I had asked him to sign transformations because I have a first edition hardbound copy. Um, he actually um, crossed out Connie Ray's name. First of all, he asked me why was why because Connie Ray's signature was in it, and I uh, he said why why did she sign this book? And I said well she edited she uh, transcribed mm -hmm. it all and edited it. And he crosses it out, he signs his name, 
and somebody who was looking over his shoulder, probably a person about my age who didn't know much of the history of NLP, said, um, who, you know, who is, who's Connie Ray? And, and uh, Ben Lee just had like a wry grin and he said, Steve's girlfriend. <laughs> and I was like, oh, I don't know what that's about. I don't know, maybe it was in a bad mood. Yeah, maybe. But, but that was... Connie Ray did the most of the work on that, on that book. Mm. We did edit it together, but she did the bulk of the work. What do you think of the the future of NLP? Where it's going? Is it going to last? Uh, will its reputation um, come around? What are your thoughts on that? I don't know. Somebody once asked Richard, "What about the future of NLP?" He said, "If he knew, the fu if he knew what the future was, he'd invent it now and promulgate it and make it known." Who knows what the future brings? A field is not really a field, it's more like a herd of cats. There's a wonderful YouTube video called Herding Cats. I don't know if you've seen it. Mm -hmm. Oh, you gotta see it. It's, it's a kick. Okay. It's a real kick. It's only three or four minutes long. I forgot what it's an ad for, but it's a wonderful video, Herding Cats. Um, there are a lot of people doing a lot of different things, calling it NLP, and there's no control over it. No quality control either by some kind of organized uh, authoritative body that has control and there's no control, even just people talking to each other and discussing differences of opinion and differences of methodology and epistemology and technology. Is, it's essentially where physics was a couple of hundred years ago, where there are kind of little isolated people and groups here and there, doing experiments with batteries and magnets. And they didn't really know what they were doing, but they started talking to each other and there were bitter disagreements and it took a couple hundred years to bring physics to where it is now. I would take that as uh, optimistic about uh, where it's going. Um, well, uh, that's what I hope. Yeah. Uh, CBT is mostly about verbal behavior. You're, talking to yourself in various ways. They don't really d drill down to the actual experience beneath the words, which is really the, the big problem with most psychotherapy, is they don't get at the actual experience that people are having. And, uh, you know, psychology promised something about 100 years ago and they never delivered on it. William James is probably the first and last psychologist. Hmm. He's amazing, if you read his original writings. He had all sorts of insight and all sorts of understanding that most people didn't, haven't had before or since. How did you come about scope and category? Well, I got some hints from John McWhirter talking about space, he called it space. Category is groups of experiences usually given a name that satisfy certain criteria. That's that's basic in all science, you know, you talk about mammals, well what's a mammal? A mammal is a warm-blooded vertebrate that breastfeeds its young. Those are the crit fundamental criteria, you could invent others. Mm. Uh, any animal, including a platypus, that satisfies those criteria is a member of that category. So categories are fairly easy, they've been around for a long time. The, Linnaean categories of all the uh, different animals and plants and bugs and stuff like that, that's all about categorization. Mm -hmm. Scope is a little different, it's more getting, getting down to the actual experience that somebody has. When they say chair, if I say, you know, think of a, think of a chair, an image pops into your mind. That's the, that's the scope that is a prototype for the category. It's an actual uh, concrete visual experience. The phobia cure changes the scope of an experience from being inside it, looking out of your own eyes, of a traumatic experience, of a, well, literally a PTSD experience, of being shocked and life-threatening. And when you change and you take a point of view outside yourself looking down and you see yourself freaking out. That's a different scope of experience and it's 
profoundly effective in changing somebody's response to a horrible memory. So that was a big clue. We talk about a change in perspective, of seeing things from a different point of view. I mean, the classic, the classic uh, sentence that lets you know you just made a useful change is when somebody says, gosh, I never looked at it that way, or some variation on that. Mm -hmm. That tells you that they've got a new scope, and the new scope becomes kind of categorized in a different way. And that's really what it's all about, changing the scope. You can change the category without changing the scope, but if you change the scope, it usually changes the category spontaneously. And that's what you really want, a spontaneous change, mm -hmm. rather than laborious intellectualizations that don't really work. Well, I think that's why I struggled with scope and category at first, because I was intellectualizing a little too much, and I wasn't grasping how this was really happening in my my real experience. And I remember sending you an email about it. I was just saying, I'm, having, I'm struggling with this. And you said, well, uh, you're already doing it with the self-concept model. It's all based on scope and category. Right. And as soon as you said that, it just popped into place. Yeah. And I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> well, I gave you I something you'd already experienced. Mm -hmm. Uses a rubric for it. Right. And everything that you were just saying just now was making me think about, um, you know, I think you had asked me one time, um, based on what you knew about my family, like how, how I... Uh, I don't know, become different than the rest of my family. And I, I think it was, um, I attribute a lot of it to travel. And when I was just hearing you say that about scope, when you're changing perspective, I mean, that to me is what travel does. Not, maybe not for everyone, but for me especially, that you're, you're seeing the world from a different perspective, especially when you can understand the culture a little bit better, a different culture. Right. And when you do that, when you start gathering these multiple perspectives, it's not about finding the right perspective, it's the cultivation of wisdom from seeing from so many different perspectives. Sometimes it's a matter of finding a better perspective. One that's more useful it may not be the right one or the wrong one, but a more useful one. Mm -hmm. Usefulness is a big criterion for me. A driver, I like to be useful to people. Now at this point, I'm very little use to anybody. That's been a bit of a challenge. Hmm. Well, I wouldn't count yourself out <laughs> yet. You've been uh, like you're doing been this. Close. You're still answering questions and everything. Um, well, I still have a little bit of energy, and I like to devote it to that. But it's fading fast. Many things I used to be able to do and not even think about it now. And now I have to think about it. Just getting out of bed. It's a struggle. Mm -hmm. It's going to be a real game changer when I can't get out of bed on my own. You know, some some illnesses are, are periodic, or you have an illness for a while, and you. A guy had a badly broken ankle when I was in high school, and I knew I was going to get better. I didn't know how much better. I might have limped a little bit or something, but the illness was time limited. And now the illness that I have, Parkinson's disease, is progressive. There ain't no cure for it. They have different varieties, but none of them has a cure. Mm -hmm. None of them has a real treatment. So it's a bit of a drag. So we're circling around to death and dying. I really don't want to be a vegetable or anything like it. I don't want to be a burden on other people. So at a certain point, death becomes a releaser rather than a, than a threat. What are your thoughts on uh, usefulness and morality? Are they uh, are they opposed to each other? Do they fit well to each other? Are they Should we base morality on usefulness? Do you have any thoughts on that? Well, I don't really use the word morality much. Um, there's a good deal of research that shows that morality is built in. There's a wonderful YouTube video, I think if you call it uh, fairness, if you Google or you search for fairness and monkeys, it's a lovely experiment they did where they took two monkeys side by side in a cage. And 
A monkey's task is to put a token in a box, and if it's to put a token in the box, they get a treat. Mm, that's all the same. And uh, so the two monkeys are side by side. And if you give them both a little piece of cucumber, which they like, they'll put a, a token in the box to get another piece of cucumber. But then if you give the one monkey a, a grape, which is far prefer preferable to cucumber, mm -hmm. the other one will refuse the cucumber and actually throw it at the experimenter. Mm -hmm. So there's certain built-in ideas about fairness, which in modern-day U.S. politics seems to be uh, completely out the window. Mm -hmm. I mean, the whole thing about people of a different color skin being treated fairly, different colored eyes, or different colored hair, different sexual habits and stuff like that. Even if you don't like something, you could be fair about it. And that seems to be completely out the window. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, there's all sorts of pressures to be fair, but there's a huge reaction against it. And people in financial situations where they have huge advantages over other people, they don't seem to realize it at all. No empathy for somebody who is unprepared for the marketplace and basically is only good for digging ditches or being a flagman on a road crew and how limited their life is and how little choice they have really to advance themselves and be more useful to other people. There's where we could use a little empathy. Well, thank you very much uh, yeah. for sitting down with me to do this. Thank you very much for letting me uh, come over and uh, have this time. Well, I hope you have some use for it. I do. See, there's usefulness again. <laughs> Check out my website, nlp-gym.com. Follow me on Facebook for real-time updates on upcoming trainings that I'm doing, new online trainings that I'm releasing, and also talks that I may be giving in your area. Also, like I said, if you haven't subscribed to this channel, please do that now so that you can get these videos on a regular basis, and make sure you sign up for that webinar. Take care. The survival of the pack depended on the cooperation between the individuals in the pack and so on. Mm -hmm. But it was limited. Hopefully we can go beyond that. Sometimes people ask me about the future of humanity. And I say, give us another couple hundred thousand years. Hmm. So we've been on the planet for at least that long. Hmm. We made some progress. Long way to go. If we survive. Yeah. Okay, I think that's about done. All right. I think I need to rest. Okay, thank you so much. You bet. Take care. All right. We might have time this afternoon to do another thing if you have any more questions. Sure. I mean, if you have the time and the energy. Well, we'll find out. Okay. Great. It's not a promise. It's a, <laughs> it's a maybe. All right, no problem. Uh, can I get you anything, like water or anything? Tell me what time it is. Uh, okay, I can do that.